We're on the outskirts of Cusco, a city in Peru. It's lunchtime and more than two dozen children have come down from the hills for a free hot meal from the soup kitchen. This comedor, as it's known, is organized by Renato Ratzel. Each year she flies over from Germany for a few months to help her friend Aida. Today the children are celebrating the chocolate festival, which takes place just before Christmas. Renata Ratzel is blind. She first came here as a tourist in the 1990s and decided to help children who get little to eat. They're the children of people who come down to Cusco from the highlands in search of a job. If their parents are lucky, they'll find a bit of work somewhere. But their children live on the streets. When I saw this, I thought, this is unacceptable. You've got to do something. Everyone, I think, has some kind of dream or wish they want to see fulfilled. Renata's wish was to help poor children. She financed this project mainly with her own money. But with that nearly all gone, what does the future hold? Footage from 1989, when Renata Ratzel was teaching in a school for the blind and visually impaired in Stuttgart. Her pupils were often mentally or physically disabled as well. Being blind herself, teaching Braille was a major challenge for Renata. But she always enjoyed the time spent with her pupils. She often organized interesting days out for them, like a trip to the zoo. It was fascinating for the children to touch a boa constrictor and experience what its skin feels like. Asked what it feeds on, they were told by the keeper that it's particularly fond of rats, guinea pigs and small rabbits. <laughs> Renata Ratzel first visited Cusco in 1994, several years before she retired. She got to know Aida and her children purely by accident. At the time, the family were living in a primitive shack. I just couldn't believe that people could be living in such conditions. The shack consisted of boards that backed onto a rock. The kitchen was a simple kerosene stove. The children were still small. And there was a horde of other youngsters there as well. Ida and I became friends right away. So had einfach die Freundschaft. Es war sofort ein Kontakt da. Y trabajaba de todas maneras. Yo también tenía que agarrar pico y pala. Back then, I too had to wield a pick and shovel to show the other workers how to do it. I helped construct schools, build steps, and improve a road. I also worked on the market at Guancha selling potatoes. What I am today, I owe to her, because I have learned to have a lot of strength. I have learned to respect myself as a woman, as a mother, and as a wife. Renata gave Aida not only strength, but also money, so that she could build this house, for instance. But what motivated her involvement here? We're not on this planet for no reason. We're here for a specific purpose. Basically, human beings should always leave behind something that shows they have done good in their lives. The cathedral is the main attraction on the Plaza de Armas, the central square in Cusco. Large numbers of tourists come here, and so do many Peruvians. They arrange to meet here to go shopping or to do something else together. On the Plaza de Amas, life seems easy. A few streets away, the pavements are narrower. There are lots of people trying to sell something or to earn a few soles. On the edge of town, in the suburb of San Jacinto, where Ida lives, the buildings look shabbier. Numerous buses from the surrounding area stop here. 
In the evening, they transport people back into the countryside. Anything that hasn't been sold during the day is taken back home. Roadside kitchens offer snacks for those waiting for buses. This is how foreigners imagine Peru, with typical traditional costumes very much in evidence. It's not immediately obvious just what life is really like for people here. Many children spend the day here. Attendance at school is not compulsory, and it's children like these that Renata Ratzel wants to help. It's nearly Christmas. The presents for these children also cost money. It's also because of her faith that Renata devotes so much of her energies to the youngsters. My faith has always meant a great deal to me, and it has helped me through a lot of real crises. Crises simply happen in life. And then you ask yourself, who should I turn to? Here, Renata is playing a board game with Piroska, Ida's grown-up daughter. Piroska would like a place of her own, but as a teacher with a private institute, she doesn't earn enough. Evelyn, who's just turned 10, has been living with the family as a foster child for three months now. Today is a big day for little Evelyn. She's going to be christened in this church. Her previous family couldn't afford a baptism. Through the baptismal service, Evelyn will be accepted into the body of the church. The little girl is in sore need of the Lord's protection. Her mother died giving birth to her. Evelyn grew up with relatives, but even then she did not have a good life. When she was nine years old, Evelyn was raped by two male relatives. Today she's safe with Aida and Renata. A court has approved their fosterage. Now, through baptism, the two women are asking God that he too might protect the little girl. Amen. What will the future hold for little Evelyn? Will she do well at school and afterwards get a job? Roughly half the population of Peru lives below the breadline. Is that a faith that Evelyn could well face? La bendición de Dios Todopoderoso, Padre, Hijo y Espíritu Santo, descienda sobre vosotros. But today, Evelyn isn't thinking about the future. At the moment, she's too overwhelmed by the church and her baptism. But the adults, perhaps, are already thinking a stage further. After the baptism, the family go back to Aida's home for some refreshments. Her husband, Lucho, has deserted the family, but no one misses him. Roy, the youngest son, is present, along with Piroska and Aida and Leonid. Age 22, he's the second youngest. Naturally, Evelyn's there as well. Now, she's the only foster child. <laughs> Three months ago, the other foster child, Katarina, died. She's buried in this cemetery. She lived with Ida's family for three years. She, too, was raped by her own father. Katarina was blind and she had cancer. Not even an operation could save her. It looks so bare, says Leonid. We need to get some flowers and add a touch of paint. Her death at such a young age wasn't entirely the result of her illness. There was a demonstration outside our house, and it was struck by a tear gas canister. Katarina inhaled the fumes. She was on a breathing apparatus for nearly a week, but we just couldn't help her. In all, Katharina spent three years with us. 
She certainly wouldn't have enjoyed a long life because she was also an epileptic. But we tried to make her stay with us as happy as possible. We laughed a lot together and we played a lot together. It gave her so much pleasure. So I think it was time well spent. We're heading into the city center, to the market hall. Leonid has bruised his arm, so today Bari, one of his friends, is driving. The two women want to buy food for the children and the rest of the family. Renata could let Aida go shopping on her own, but she enjoys helping to choose the various goods and paying for them, even though things take a little more time when she comes along. Food is a lot cheaper here than in Germany. Nevertheless, a family of six takes some feeding, and the daily meals for the Commodore children also cost a fair bit. The soup kitchen does benefit from the occasional donations from Germany, but because of her disability, Renata Ratzley is obviously not the best possible person for collecting contributions. Consequently, she keeps having to fall back on her savings. But sooner rather than later, they will be exhausted. It's now evening, and people are leaving the city centre. There are very few large buses in Cusco. So most travelers use the colectivos, as they're known. These minibuses are often packed, but hardly anybody minds. Indeed, many people can only afford the cheap fares on the colectivos. Cusco lies at an altitude of 3,300 meters, and the surrounding mountains are even higher, and mainly barren. The Holy Valley, a nearby fertile region where fruit and vegetables are grown. These people own the land they till, so they're better off than other agricultural workers, but they still don't earn enough to afford modern technology. The bigger children are either at home or they're working somewhere. The toddlers have to spend all day in the fields with their parents. <laughs> Naturally, these children don't have any toys. They're just too expensive. So they play with whatever they can find. Few parents can afford to send their offspring to kindergarten or school. Located not far from the field, near Pisac, are ancient terraces and ruins from the days of the Incas. Hardly anyone seems interested in these once splendid buildings. Yet the historic Inca city of Machu Picchu, which lies even further away from Cusco, is inundated with tourists. There's simply a Peru that's known about and one that's unknown. And this school certainly belongs to the latter category. Renata Ratzel often helps out in one of the classes in which most of the children have to earn their school fees themselves. Renata mainly helps individual children who struggle to understand what they're being taught, which isn't surprising if they've been working for several hours before going to school. Renata learns that this girl has to sell things. She has to work from six in the morning until midday. This little girl says she has to help her aunt sell spices on the market. She too works from 6 a.m. through to midday. One of the boys wants to know why Renata is helping them. People aren't rich in the country I come from, Renata says, but there's always a bit left over for someone in need. It's important not to forget your neighbor. 
Many of the children have written their Christmas greetings and their thanks for Renata's help on cards. She will have to have the cards read to her later, but she's delighted all the same. Renata has given the girls in her class dolls as a present. One of the pupils, Florencia, was in the same class as Caterina, who died. Asked what her doll is called, Florencia says, Caterina. I remember her, she tells Renata. So do I, says Renata. In San Geronimo, every day is market day. Many of the children Renata comes into contact with work here, humping or selling food, all the produce that's on offer here. In return for their efforts, the children are given something to eat or a bit of money. After all, they're not yet fully adequate workers. Child labor isn't illegal here, and no one has any job security. Nobody knows how much or how little they will earn on any particular day. The market has fixed walls, stands, and roofs. But anyone who can't afford to rent a stand simply spreads out their wares on the ground. This boy works here regularly in order to get something to eat. He's only eight, but he already has the build of a 12-year-old. If he doesn't fall ill before then, one day he'll be able to handle the hard work done by the men. Having no work was only one of the problems Ida's family has had to face. Henry, her oldest son, needed surgery to treat a brain tumor. The operation was paid for by Renata Ratzel. Leonid, who still lives here, also needed surgery. Even as an eight-year-old, perhaps even earlier, Leonid kept collapsing while playing. He was exhausted, out of breath. The doctor we took him to said that a vein in his heart had become blocked and needed to be operated on. But this couldn't be done until he was 14 or 15. Until then, he had to be helped with medication. Later, he had the necessary operation. If Renata hadn't been there, I really have no idea what the future would have held for me. I'm very happy to have her with us. I have so much faith in her. I tell her everything. Most important of all, she is teaching me all about life. When a poor person is sick, there are few possibilities open to them. None, in fact. If the illness is serious, that person will die, because there is no one willing or able to help. This autumn, Ida herself needed surgery. If the teacher from Germany hadn't paid for the operations the family needed, the consequences could well have been grim. We'd have died, that's the truth. Because here you have to pay for everything yourself. Medication is expensive and generic medicines are virtually useless. Sometimes it rains in Cusco. There's even a regular rainy season. Not far from Ida's home is a service garage for trucks. When it rains, the men are glad to be able to work inside, even though the garage is more like a shack. Anyone here can be sacked from one day to the next. There's no such thing as unemployment benefits. Neither, of course, is there anything like compensation for those injured or even permanently disabled at work. We're in the mountains near Cusco. It's December the 8th, a Catholic religious holiday, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. People from the surrounding villages have come together to take part in a ceremonial procession.
procession heads on to a nearby village. The young men are wearing white masks, a long-standing tradition here. The festival is celebrated by young and old. Renata Ratzel is also present, together with Leonid. She receives a warm welcome from Elena, a woman who used to work in a school for the blind in Cusco. She can't actually see the masks, but Renata can easily tell the different materials apart by feeling them. She speaks to one of the young masked men. I'm blind and come from Germany, she tells him and I find your costume really interesting. Leonid explains to Renata that the man's gloves are made of wool. He also tells her that the mask is known as a colla. Renata thinks the mask is beautiful. The man, she learns, is called Wilson. Actually, I lead two lives, one in Europe and the other here in Latin America. This family here in Peru is my family. And that gives me a really good feeling. Renata has sent the family money time and again. Donations she has received, but mainly money from her pension. Her charitable work in South America has earned her recognition back in Germany. Two years ago, she was awarded the Federal Order of Merit, but the order is of little help where money is concerned. The family live off what I can send them. Sometimes they find some casual work, but that doesn't bring in anywhere near enough. What's more, we've taken in another foster child. She had no one in the world to look after her. Renata Ratzel intends to keep providing for Evelyn. In future, however, she'll be sending Aida far less money. Renata just hasn't got the funds any longer. So I'll have to start selling my mate at the bus stop again. To be honest, what concerns me is Evelyn, the little girl for whom I've assumed responsibility. I'll get by, of course. There's no doubt about that. I'm so grateful to Renata. And I'm also ashamed that I've perhaps lived off her because she has helped us with her money. My faith helps me because it gives me the chance to talk to God. When I have a serious problem, I often talk quite normally to him. I always have the feeling that he is close by me, that I have not been left alone with things that can sometimes be really difficult in this country. Her faith helps her to believe that, somehow or other, things will go on the way they have done. The children have no idea how worried Renata is about the future of her project. They're too busy playing with their toys. The children have a long trip back ahead of them. So the women are frying meat and making hamburgers with lots of delicious ingredients to sustain them on the way. Here too, Renata tries to help where she can. She just has no idea whether she'll be able to continue providing the children with a hot daily meal. But she's certain that this work is right for her. The wonderful thing about this work is that it means I can be together with the children, and they're always happy to see me again. The little ragamuffins who are always whirling around like dervishes really have developed into responsible youngsters. The children have gone. Now there's just Evelyn. 
and Renata Ratzel is worried about the child's future. <laughs> Sometimes I really despair. I just don't know how I'm going to go on. I have my ups and downs. But it's not that I think, why don't you just leave it all to the dear Lord? I've not got that far just yet. I always nurture the hope that at some time or other something will happen. A small miracle that will enable the work here to continue.